Hi Howdy, my name is John and this video is a spoiler free review and a spoiler discussion of the book Dragons of Spring Dawning by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. This is the third book in the Dragonlance Chronicles trilogy. The first part of the video will be spoiler free and then I will warn you of spoilers to come and the rest of it will be a discussion containing spoilers from the book. There's a lot about this book that I did not like and there's a lot about this book that I did like. Not really going to go into too much depth about what I didn't like in the non-spoiler section. The authors made a lot of questionable decisions as they kind of plotted out this novel and I'll talk about those one by one in the spoiler section. One thing I noted in my review of the second book, Dragons of Winter Night, is that the authors had too many characters for the reader to follow effectively. One nice thing about this novel is that it actually narrows the list of characters down a little bit, just enough so that you can kind of effectively follow them. Now some of the characters do go off the page for long stretches of time and that does help some as well although you are kind of left wondering what is happening to them. The thing that I really liked about this novel are the interactions between characters contained within its pages. I will get to those in the spoiler section. I wound up giving this novel three stars. The bad kind of balances out the good, and while it's not my favorite read, nor will I think it will be anybody's favorite read, this is a book worth reading, mostly because of how well it sets up the later books in the series. One thing to note is I am reading this book out of the annotated uh, version. The annotations add a uh, lot to the reading experience. I would suggest reading the, the unannotated version first as the annotations do contain spoilers. There is a plan for a live discussion of this book on the channel Andrew's Wizardly Reads. As of filming this video, I do not know when that will be or whether or not I will be able to participate. I'll probably wait to release this video until after the announcement is made and I will link that information in the description below. Alright, let's get into the book and discuss some spoilers. I'll start with the things that I did not like in this novel. And to start out with first, I didn't really care for the uh, Everman or Barum as his name is. I didn't really care for that storyline. Honestly, the story could have done without it. It winds up being kind of a Lord of the Rings ripoff where you know there's one guy or one object that kind of magically fixes everything. Really, that's kind of a problem I've had with the series uh, as well is that it seems like every dragon got fixed by a magical uh, object that had extraordinary power. The first dragon was the black dragon and it was defeated by the uh, blue crystal staff. The next dragon was the red dragon and you wind up having the older matron dragon attacking the younger male dragon. In the second book you have the white dragon which is driven off really by just a, an arrow wound which you know if you've ever fought a dragon in Dungeons and Dragons it takes more than that to scare them off. The green dragon was defeated when Raceland took charge of the dragon orb and then the blue dragons were defeated when Lorana used the dragon orb to summon them into a trap. The next thing I want to talk about is a scene with Tannis. Tannis is actually my favorite character in the series, and but he gets on my nerves just a little bit in this novel. The scene where Tannis returns to his friends after spending several days with Kitiara, Goldmoon actually suggests to him that he get some rest so that they can leave the next morning at which point Tannis snarls at her and tells her that no one is going anywhere in this storm. Well, it turns out the very next morning, the storm has gone away and Tannis is all ready for all of them 
to get on board the ship and leave so that they cannot be discovered. It's a decision that the, the authors really should have thought through a little bit more carefully. Now, the next item I did talk about in my spoiler-filled discussion that I did when I first started my channel, and I'll link it in the description below, and there's actually a fairly long comment and uh, a discussion that I had with a viewer um, that defended Lorana. I personally find it unbelievable that Lorana would have been made the commander of the Salamic Knights. She's really just a teenage girl at this point. Yeah, she's technically older, but because she's an elf, she's about at that uh, maturity level. And maybe the authors were going for a Joan of Arc vibe here. Uh, not really sure, but uh, I just find it difficult to believe that Lorana would have actually been made the commander. She doesn't have the training, she doesn't have the experience, and really she does not have the leadership ability required to take on that role. And we'll see that play out uh, when uh, Kitiara tells her that Tannis is uh, dying and that uh, she needs to go and uh, visit with him. That whole storyline really should have been reworked. I can definitely see Lorana in a kind of golden general where she's more of a symbolic figure than the actual leader of the, uh, of the knights. But really, this entire sequence does not make sense. Now, I will say that I may have been influenced by the annotations of this because the authors do actually admit that this was a mistake on their part. And I'd like to read uh, both of their statements. And I'm going to start with Margaret Weiss's comments first. This scene precipitated the first disagreement between Tracy and I while writing these books. The plot had been designed from the beginning to have Lorana give up her generalship to go chasing after Tannis. By the time we came to write this part, I did not believe that Lorana, as I knew her, would give up her generalship, in effect leave her troops in the lurch to go save her fickle lover. Tracy the Romantic maintained that love conquers all and that she would. Because she had to do this in order for the plot to work, I gave in. But it was difficult writing this scene and providing her with a convincing motivation that didn't make her sound like a lovesick ninny. By the way, Tracy has since come to agree with me. The next comment is from Tracy Hickman. Yes, Lorana is acting as a lovesick ninny here. Indeed, I do agree with Margaret now. As I look back, my initial understanding of the character and her motivations were centered around rather adolescent images rather than mature ones. In the book as it stands, Lorana's motivations are questionable and irrational. While I remain an incurable romantic, I believe that Lorana's choice here makes her more of a victim than a leader, and women shouldn't be victims. Love may conquer a good many things, but abusive relationships are not among them. The next scene I want to talk about is where Tannis must present himself to Tachesis, and he must convince her that he is loyal to her. Somehow, Tannis manages to convince a goddess that he is loyal. I'm not really sure that a mortal could have convinced a goddess of this. And yet, somehow, Tannis manages to do it. Now, maybe we can rationalize this as it's not really a, a full representation of Tachesis. That's actually in the world. And you know, maybe because of this, there, uh, Tannis is able to hide his motivations. But personally, I find this scene to be unbelievable. The last thing I want to mention in this section is the scene where there is a mad scramble for the crown because whoever wears the crown rules. Again, this is to Lord of the Rings with the, the One Ring. And really, the story should have been written differently here, in my opinion.
Now, let's get to the character interactions that I really enjoyed. The first one I want to talk about is when Tannis is telling what has happened to him while he was away from the rest of the group, and Raceland knows that he is lying. And Raceland chooses to keep that information to himself. This, to me, is perfectly within Raceland's character, and I find it to be a nice character moment. The next thing I want to mention is the relationship between Raceland and Caramon, especially after Raceland deserts the group and Caramon is devastated. Now, the relationship between these two does get developed more in the Legends trilogy and in the Raceland Chronicles trilogy, which happens before the events of the Chronicles. Caramon, in many ways, has been Raceland's caretaker for much of their lives. Given that I have read these additional books, I can really kind of see how Caramon and Raceland's relationship developed and how it degenerated, and how even though they're, they are at odds now, they're still brothers and they still care for one another. At least, Caramon cares for Raceland. There's a passage that I want to read that illustrates this. All right, this is Caramon speaking, and I am going to skip around a little bit. They don't understand. They don't need me. Even Tika doesn't need me. Not like Raceley needed me. His eyes were wild with the sight of terrors only he could see. He clutched at me, sobbing, and I'd tell him stories or make funny shadow pictures on the wall to drive away the horror. Look, raced, I'd say, bunnies. And I'd hold up two fingers and wiggle them, like a rabbit ears. After a while, he'd stop trembling. He wouldn't smile or laugh. He never did either much, even when he was little. But he would relax. Next thing I want to bring up is the relationship between Flint and Tasselhoff. These two really kind of serve as the comic relief of the Chronicles, uh, along with Tasselhoff and Fizban, but uh, I'll get to Fizban later. Flint and Tasselhoff, they just work really well together, and I enjoy the scenes that they are in, in all three books. The next thing I want to bring up is this book serves as the introduction for Lord Soth. Lord Soth is just a very interesting character. Now, he will come into his own a little bit more in the Legends trilogy. I did enjoy getting to uh, this introduction to him. The next scene I want to bring up, I actually brought this up in my old spoiler-filled video on the Chronicles as a whole, but I want to bring it up here again. To set the scene, Tannis is questioning why the others follow him, and Goldmoon refers as follows. They were silent watching him. Then Gold Moon stepped forward. Shall I tell you a story, half elf? she said, resting her gentle hand upon his arm. A story of a woman and man, lost and alone and frightened. Bearing a great burden, they came to an end. The woman sang a song. A blue crystal staff performed a miracle. A mob attacked them. One man stood up. One man took charge. One man, a stranger, said, We'll go out through the kitchen. She smiled. Do you remember Tannis? I remember, he whispered, caught and held by her beautiful, sweet expression. We're waiting, Tannis, she said simply. I think this passage beautifully describes why Tannis is the leader. When the situation is critical and quick action must be taken, Tannis is the one who is able to formulate a plan and get the others to carry it out. While Tannis did annoy me in this book, he actually is a flawed character and that makes him more interesting. Now, the, the authors do point out this out in one of the annotations, and I do happen to agree. He could have handled it a little bit better, but Tannis's uh, failures 
do make him more interesting. Tannis's willingness to question his decisions makes him an interesting character and a moral character. He's constantly wondering what the right thing to do is. He holds himself to a very high standard. These are the qualities that I think we should be looking for when we look for our leaders. This next scene happens as Tannis and the others are planning on leaving Kalamon and they are leaving Riverwind and Goldmoon behind. Book two ends with the following passage. What if it does end in darkness, Tannis wondered for the first time. What will become of the world? What will become of those I'm leaving behind? Steadily he looked up at these two people who were as dear to him as the family he'd never known. And as he watched, he saw Goldmoon light a candle. For a brief instant, the flame illuminated her face in river winds. They raised their hands in parting, then extinguished the flames, lest unfriendly eyes see it. Taking a deep breath, Tannis turned and tensed himself to run. The darkness may conquer, but it could never extinguish hope. And though one candle, or many, might flicker and die, new candles would be lit from the old. Thus hope's flame always burn, lighting the darkness until the coming of day. The next thing I want to talk about is Flint's death. I think this is fairly well handled. It does get uh, foreshadowed a little bit too heavy-handedly in this book, but overall, I did find it to be satisfying. The last thing I want to talk about is one of my favorite characters, and that's Fizban. At the end of the novel, we find out that Fizban is actually Paladin, the good god, in human form. Once you realize this, and you actually go back and reread the three books in the trilogy, it makes for a really interesting read. Kind of makes you wonder what Fizban was actually up to, because he actually drives a lot of the events in the story. The next thing I want to read uh, is a scene where Fizban is telling Tasselhoff about Flint in uh, Flint's version of Heaven and how he's waiting on Tasselhoff to join him. Fizban puts these words into Tasselhoff's mouth. Flint, have you heard about my latest adventure? Well, there was this black robed wizard and his brother and me and we went on a journey through time, and the most wonderful things happened. This passage is actually a brief description of what will happen in the Legends trilogy. The last thing I want to mention is the iconic scene of this series where Fizban is looking for his hat as he flies away on the gold dragon, only to have someone mention to him that his hat is on top of his head. I've really enjoyed my reread of the Dragonlance Chronicles. I certainly don't love everything that's in this, these books. And, you know, I gave this book three stars. It's not one of my favorites. It is, however, the start of an expanded universe that I've really enjoyed reading over the last year and a half, two years or so. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.